Good afternoon, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. And Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are delighted to be here with you this afternoon and with our friends at the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American culture and history to celebrate the life and legacy of Zora Neale Hurston through the book, Jump at the Sun, the true life tale of, un I, ooh, I'm just, it's such a, it's such a great, of unstoppable story catcher, Zora Neale Hurston. Um, I did not want to mess that up because it's such an important title um, because she was an unstoppable story catcher. Um, we're going to talk ab all about Zora's legacy, what, why we want children to know about Zora, why um, her, her example has meant so much to so many of us as a Southern author, a Florida author, as a black woman, as an anthropologist, um, and just as somebody who told fun stories. Um, so however old you are, whether you're a young person here watching um, or a, a person who likes to support young people in their educational journey, we are glad you're here. If you have questions, you can ask them in the ask a question box at any time at the bottom center of your screen. Uh, Morris Gardner from Auburn Avenue is here with us today and his capacity as a research librarian. He'll be dropping knowledge in the chat. Um, please feel free to go back at the end and click on all of those links. The research library is currently closed for browsing, but they are open uh, online and very willing to help you with your own research. So if today's event sparks an interest for you and you want to know more, that is a great place to learn about the life of Zora Neale Hurston. They have incredible archives and a lot of wonderful resources. Um, so let me introduce first our interviewer today is someone that Karis folks know well, Dr. Susanna Morris. Susanna is an associate professor of literature, media, and communication at the Georgia Institute of Technology. She's the co-founder and contributing writer for the popular feminist blog, The Crunk Feminist Collective. And her first book was Close Kin and Distant Relatives, The Paradox of Respectability in Black Women's Literature. Her most recent book is The Crunk Feminist Collection. So we're glad to have you here with us today, Susanna. And we are here with Alicia D. Williams, who is the author of Jump at the Sun. She is also the author of Genesis Begins Again, which received a Newbery and Kirkus Prize and was a William C. Morris Award finalist, and for which she won a Coretta Scott King John Steptoe Award for New Talent. Alicia is a graduate of the MFA program at Hamline University and an oral storyteller in the African American tradition. She is also a teacher in Charlotte, North Carolina, and she has a forthcoming book on Shirley Chisholm, which we're very excited about as well. So welcome, Alicia. We're thrilled to have you here. And um, with us as well is the illustrator, Jacqueline Alcan Alcantara, who is um, also the illustrator of the critically acclaimed The Field and Freedom Soup, um, as well as Your Mama, um, which is forthcoming, which we're also going to be celebrating soon. Um, her favorite days are spent drawing, painting, writing, and walking her dog. Uh, in 2016, she was awarded the inaugural We Need Diverse Books Illustrator Mentorship. Find more at her website, which we'll be dropping in the chat. So um, we love it when we get to have both the author and illustrator with us for children's books because it really deepens our understanding. So we're going we're gonna to jump right in and jump at the sun with both of you. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Hi, Suzanne. How are you? So nice to meet you. Good afternoon. I am delighted to be here and to be oh. talking with both of you about this awesome book. So I think we're going to start off by having y'all <laughs> read a little bit. So Alicia, you're going to read and Jackie, you're going to show the illustrations and I'm going to get myself off screen. And then when y'all do that, I'm going to ask some questions and then our audience there is at the bottom of your screen kind of close to the right hand corner the ask a question button feel free to hit on that and you can put your questions there and then after our conversation we'll just include your questions so don't be shy think about them while they're reading and we'll have a great conversation thank you all right how's it looking Alicia right now we see the flap and the All one, right. yeah, back. Let me just. Okay. 
And this is in the beginning. Like if you take the cover off, you'll see the wonderful uh, illustration that J uh, Jackie has put in here. So it's another <laughs> piece of artwork for you, to, for you to have. And the hats are when you open it. So there's a good story behind the hats. So we'll get to that when Susanna comes back. And if you're young, Maybe, I wonder if you can remember where you saw those particular hats in Zora's life. So let's get it at it. Jump at the sun. The true life tale of unstoppable story catcher Zora Neil Hurston by Alicia D. Williams and illustrated by Jacqueline Alcantara. In a town called Edenville, where a place where magnolias smelled even prettier than they looked. Oranges were as sweet as they were plump. And the people just plain old God alone lived a girl who was attracted to tails like mosquitoes to skin. Zora was her name. Zora got to love and tales from hearing the townsfolk swap stories at Joe Clark's general store. Oftentimes, Mama sent her over to fetch a little sugar or salt, and Zora would stall, make a 10-minute error last an hour. Just to overhear tales like how that trickster, Burr Rabbit, always got the best of Burr Fox. Only thing pulled her away was Mama calling, Zora, if you don't come here, you better. Zora overheard. Let me tell y'all how come we got switch eyes. You know, old master had an old maid sister that never been married. Mm -hmm. well, that's the reason the dog is mad with the rabbit now, because he fooled the dog. Y'all been telling and lying about these vomits, but you ain't yet spoke about the high chief boss of all the world, which is the lion. When there were no errands to run and Zora couldn't get an earful of tails, she'd make up her own. She'd fashion dials from scraps she found. A loose doorknob became Reverend Doorknob. The do not touch pear scented soap was carved into Mr. Sweet Smell. Ears of corn were hewed into Miss Corn Shuck and Miss Corn Cobb. Zora had stories to tell and stories needed characters. Hello, Reverend Doorknob. Smelling good, Mr. Sweet Smell. Thank you kindly. Uh, hello to you, Miss Cornshuck. And when Mama sent Zora and her stories out of the house, Zora perched herself atop their gay post, calling out to travelers. Don't you want me to go a piece of the way with you? If a car stopped, Zora climbed right in. She'd have those people laughing like she was storytelling on Joe Clark's porch herself. Then, Half a mile or so later, she'd hop out and stroll on home. Now, back then, some folks called storytelling, telling lies. And if Zora's preacher papa got home from church and caught her spouting him, ooh, he'd give chase lightning quick. Even Zora's grandma aimed to sting her backside, ooh, but never could. Now with Mama's arms stretched wide as tree limbs. Truth was, Mama proved the st Zora storytelling. She didn't fancy the idea of her children tilling land, so she encouraged, encouraged Zora to jump at the sun. You might not land on the sun, but at least you get off the ground. Well, fact is, Zora clung to those words tighter than Burr Fox would have clung to Burr Rabbit if he'd ever been able to catch him. Zora needed him too, because one day, Mama got herself a chest cold that wouldn't get better. Then one September evening, Mama closed her eyes for the last time. Zora and her sister and brothers were so sobbing hearted that even the house seemed to mourn. Two days later, Zora's only sister and her older brother headed back to school. Papa was already on the road preaching. His boy seemed manageable, but his tale-telling girl was too much for him to worry about. So 
Two weeks after the funeral, he shipped Zora off to Florida Baptist Academy boarding school. Zora dug her nose in books, intent on reaching the sun. It was what mama had always taught her to do after all. Then her papa got a new wife who was stingier than a peacock. Zora's stepmother tight fisted their money, school fees went unpaid, and back to Eatonville, Zora went. Hmm. To hear Zora tell it, back home, hmm, the walls were gummy with gloom with her little brothers in ragged, dirty clothes. Ooh, this was wrong, and Zora made it known. Fussing and fighting commenced from the kitchen to the gatepost. Finally, her stepmother pointed to the door and out stumped 14 year old Zora down the dusty road. Though friends spared a pallet for sleeping, there wasn't time for Zora to be pounding the capers of her rabbit. Mm -mm. She had to earn her keep. But she was better at storytelling than holding a job. She was fired from maid jobs for reading the employee's books instead of cleaning. She up and quit babysitting her oldest brother's children when he quit on his promise to let her go back to school. For 12 long years, she traveled from job to job, from Florida to Baltimore, in and out of schools. Zora was miserable, except for when she spooned out Eatonville Trixie Tales to whoever stop them up. And saints alive, folks were hungry. The son, however, was getting antsy with waiting on Zora. So he called down saying, ain't you supposed to be meeting me up here? Reckon Zora was getting antsy too. How was Zora to jump all the way to old Big Yellow? By doing what made her happiest. And Zora was happiest at school and hearing those stories. Every more. I think Are that's we stopping it. here? You keep you gonna keep going, Alicia? I can do you want me to do one page? I'll do one more page. All right. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, we we'll do one more page. In Baltimore, 26-year-olds couldn't go to public school for free. So Zora told a tale of her own. She chopped her age to 16, then plunged <laughs> herself in put herself down in high school classroom. Even though she had, lost, had a lot less money than other students, Zora walked through the halls like her shoes were lined with gold. That girl was back in school. Woo the son waited patiently for two more years until she graduated, then called out, jump, Zora. Now, now that's where I want to leave it off at. Because where would <laughs> Zora go next? Where would she jump to next? That is so awesome. That's like a perfect stopping place uh, because Zora's story <laughs> is so fascinating. I think about that all the time. And she said, 26? No, I'll be 16. And if you see <laughs> the pictures of her back then, she was so baby-faced, right? Right. Cool people, right? Do, that was I'm an awesome me. reading. I, I want my education so much that, you know what? Nothing's going to stop me. Not age, not you thinking. That, like, to have a audacity of Zora to embody that, you know how much we would get done in our lives right now if we had that zest? Gosh, and I, and I think about that. You know, we have challenge after challenge like Zora, challenge after challenge after challenge. But she did not wallow in it. She didn't wallow in, you know, my back ate, my shoes too tight. You know, she <laughs> found a way and she was resilient. I love that about her. Absolutely. So maybe where we could start is, I just want to, you know, hear a little bit about each of your individual journeys to Zora. Like how did Zora come into your lives just as readers and, and as artists? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's funny. I, I never knew who Zora was. 
until I was in college and a friend, um, Maria Fisher, was reading her. And I was at the University of Kentucky at the time. And we're in that library and she was giggling. And I'm thinking, girl, we're going to get kicked out. You're not even studying. We're supposed to be studying. And I finally got up to find out what she was reading. And she held up a Zora Neale Hurston book. I tried to get into her. I guess I never knew or wasn't my, my palate wasn't that open for uh, that, that dialect or the vernacular. And I didn't understand it. Heck, I, I wasn't even much of a reader, but she bought me a book, gifted it to me, and I have it to this day. And I tell you, when I revisited Zora at a place in my life that I was more, uh, my book knowledge was more expanded, I was like, oh my gosh, this woman, how she phrased the words and Oh my, it was like a cup of, a cup of uh, coffee and a uh, uh, buttermilk pancake. It, like, it was so rich. Like pecan pie, buttermilk, it was just all of that. And I devoured her and I watched, I, I honestly um, made everyone that came to my house at a certain period uh, after I purchased their eyes were watching God the movie. Like, you're going to watch this. You don't, you may not be a reader, but you're going to watch this movie because this is who we are. And so that kind of opened it. And I wasn't even thinking about writing a story, not until I graduated college and I still didn't think about it. And I, I went back to the idea of these folk tales because I love telling the folk tales to, to different audiences. And it was, <laughs> people say, well, how did I come up to write like Zora? Well, the honest to goodness truth, is I love art and I wanted beautiful pictures on my wall. And I thought if I watch it, write a picture book, I'll get it. And I do have it because I have Jacqueline's artwork, right? <laughs> but I thought, what? but if it can't be any story. It had to be a story that meant something to me. And Zora was the one. And, and I got to know her even more because I had to research her. But that was that, that to answer that, that's how I got to know Zora. Introduction. And I didn't know um, of Zora until, I mean, I had uh, seen photographs of her. So I, when I got the manuscript, I was like, knew of her name and could recognize her uh, pictures once I Googled her. But um, I knew Br'er Rabbit stories growing up. And so I think that piece was something that I, was really interested in um, figuring out where these came from and just learning more of them and learning where they, you know, what the history of them uh, was. But then, I mean, once I started researching her, you know, just a little bit, I mean, the first two lines of her autobiography are like the page of her autobiography. I was just like, oh my God, this is so good. <laughs> and so I read, um, a lot of her books, you know, just as a, a first introduction into her and everything I learned was just more and more impressive and I couldn't really get enough. Um, just such an amazing person, so ahead of her time, so inspiring for people today, you know. I mean, we could take so many lessons of, from, from her. Um, so yeah, I feel really fortunate that I was kind of given this project and able to dive deep into the rabbit hole of the world of Zora because it's, I, I would have been missing a lot had I not been able to discover her work. I love that. I mean, both of y'all come to this work in really different kinds of ways. And I think it really speaks to, you know, what, whenever it is in your life where you find Zora's work, I mean, she just captures you in a particular way. And in the green room earlier, we were talking about my experience and sort of getting to know Zora's work was in high school. And I went to this international baccalaureate program that we read a lot of Shakespeare and Shakespeare's great. We should continue to read him and a lot of Robert Frost and a lot of basically, you know, dead white men. We didn't read a whole lot of Black writers, right? So in the ninth grade, I remember reading the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman by Ernest Gaines, which changed my life. And then senior year, we read Their Eyes Were Watching God. And I'm from Fort Lauderdale, and she mentions Fort Lauderdale. I mean, Eatonville is Central Florida. 
my high school teacher was from Florida. Like we were, so we're reading the book. I'm hearing it in the accent of folks you know, like sort of Southern dialect. And it was like, wow, this is the first time I'm really reading something that's talking about where I'm from and talking about stuff I know, all those hurricane scenes and their eyes are watching God happen, like, you know, up the road from where I was reading the book in my little teenage hands. And so that idea of representation and telling stories, right, whether it's Br'er Rabbit, you know, I come from a Caribbean background, so I grew up hearing the Nancy stories and stuff and not really thinking of them as like, oh, these are like real stories. This is just stuff that you hear, you know, at home or something like that. But like, you know, fairy tales from Europe are not the only stories that are worth knowing, right? That these folk tales from various parts of the diaspora are really important. They tell us something. They're funny. They tell us about storytelling and they tell us something about sort of Black people's lived experience. So I, I just love hearing how y'all came to Zora. Um, Alicia, you were talking a little bit about like the research. You mentioned the word research. So I really want to hear both of your process. I mean, Jacqueline, you mentioned too about going back and reading, you know, her autobiography and stuff like that. But if you both could just talk about what research looks like for you as author and as illustrator. Suzanne, you're not about to sit here and embarrass me because I have had this question and Compared to Jackie's answer, I was like, oh, I'm just gonna shut up. Jackie, Jackie is so impressive. And maybe that is what the what a visual person does, but I feel so like, oh, I could have done so much more. So let me get mine out the way because Jackie's gonna blow you out the water. <laughs> But all I, research is good research. We all right. come to knowledge in different ways, right? I, I so, feel like I need to go come to the uh, come to the um, Georgia to come to the library and do more research. And you know, uh, let me just get mine out of the way. So yeah, Alicia, you can't say that. That's it's so not true. You did so much research. <laughs> I I literally just read. I read uh, her biographies. I read her letters. I read. Um, what other people had to say about her, the other biographies, because you would think it's a straightforward, just collect information that you might want to tell and share with young readers. But because Zora was such a storyteller and that was who she was, it was just a lot of cross-checking because a historian might have information, but the copy editors will con flag it and I'll go back to Zora's uh, biography, then the researcher's biography, and then I double checked it with her letters and those letters uh, end up being more important. Um, this was like the, the epitome of like, let me double check because these are actual dates on those letters, but it was just a lot of book reading and um, finding out what other people said and even the pictures trying to find are those authentic pictures of hers or not? Because she was elusive sometimes. But yeah, I should have done what Jackie did. But you have to hear her. And maybe we all three can do what Jackie did later on. She can take us on this home tour. No, I mean, okay, I came to it from a much different, you know, uh, perspective. Having to, like, visually represent a place, um, I really needed to go there and see it for myself and meet people in Eatonville. I have never spent any time in the South, really. You know, I'm from Chicago, so I, I had no idea what Central Florida even looked like. Um, so it was important for me to visit this visit Eatonville. Um, but I also went to, uh, one of the things that I loved about Zora was just how much she loved a good road trip. And I love road trips myself. And so I took the opportunity to kind of follow her path um, in a few parts of the country. And so, um, and I thought it was just an incredibly brave aspect of her, you know, character to be able to do that at a time when it was very dangerous to do so. Um, but anyways, I would like my, my favorite part, I guess, of my research was going down to Eatonville and trying to piece together what this place looked like, because it also just looks very different than it does today with highways and, you know, like just, so much construction construction everywhere and so i was really trying to visualize what this um place felt like what the people felt like what the energy of it was and so just talking to people uh there i went down for those Bernal hurston festival that's every january and um you know one of the things i don't think i've shared in other presentations but i did 
I found a beautiful little museum there and uh, there was an exhibition from the artist, an artist who lived there. And I did little sketches of um, all of his, actually from some of the artwork they had displayed there that was of Eatonville at this time, because he, he was alive around the like, foundation of Eatonville, which was like the very late 1800s. Um, but then I, I called them up and I, I asked them, I was like, do you guys have any more of his sketchbooks that I might be able to come back and take a look at? I'm doing this project on Zora and um, I'm just really trying to get a sense of from an artistic, not even just artistic, but just collecting photographs, any kind of stuff that I could. And so I did tons and tons of little drawings from his sketchbooks. They let me go back and um, look through everything and so I got, a, I got a really good sense of what it looks like. I got a good sense of clothing, um, houses, like all of that side of, uh, that side of it. And, um, you know, I guess that was a, a, a bit of my research that I absolutely loved. And there was, um, they kind of mentioned that this particular artist, oh my gosh, I feel so bad. I can't remember his name right now. I was trying to look for it, but I can't. But anyways, he did these, I think six or eight big, beautiful, paintings in one of the churches in Eatonville and they were like sorry but it, the church is closed you can't unless you go there as a you know practitioner or whatever you can't visit the church and I was like I'm getting in I'm getting into this church I need to see those paintings and and so uh it was like the first day of the festival I think I uh this guy was selling parking spots in the church parking lot and I was like, if I pay for a parking spot, can you let me into this church? Can you sneak me in? And I just am trying to see these paintings that they have and, and see Eatonville in the early 1900s from this guy's perspective. And he was like, okay, sure. <laughs> so so I got, a, I got um, uh, snuck into this um, church and saw these paintings that only, only people that go to the church and live in Eatonville are able to see. And I took a lot of inspiration from those. But then this guy also just wrote down this woman's name um, who has lived there for a very long time and said, you know, she has a lot of, uh, she has a lot of stuff from back in the day also. Um, give her a call, like just go over there. And he gave me her address and, and I, I just like walked over there and she had this own, her own mini little personal museum of Eatonville and uh, like some of the original Zora photographs that are just amazing. Um, and so she was just the sweetest thing. And I have to, yet to send her a copy of the book. I was hoping we could go down there for a Zora festival one of these years and I could, I could go back there. But that's a, that was a little snippet of my research that I haven't shared with other people yet. <laughs> Let the records reflect that Susanna's face was like. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, Right. For me, that's yeah. like, that's the, that's the joy of doing projects like this for me, you know, being able to connect with people that I wouldn't necessarily otherwise um, be able to connect with and, and understand and get a really great sense of the culture. Um, so I take every opportunity to kind of sneak my way into places and do that. From here on out, I'm going to embody Zora and I'll start to fabricate I went to Haiti. I went to yeah. New Orleans. I but she, to he inspired me, you know, like she really inspired me to do, to go to this extreme because that's exactly what she did. She immersed herself completely in, in getting the stories and the folk tales. you know, like she became a voodoo, <laughs> you know, apprentice right. to right. get stories that nobody else would tell. Um, so yeah. So that's why I'm so surprised that there isn't, there hasn't already been books for young readers or even, you know, a picture book biography about her. There's like a middle middle grade a fiction, you know, but there's not one to pass this legacy on to young readers. I was just so shocked that, that, about that. I mean, unfortunately, I'm not shocked because there's so many Black writers, particularly Black women writers that deserve this kind of telling, right? And I think that we kind of reserve Zora for older kids, you know, like high school and then like, a, you know, young adults college, you know? And I wonder if, because something that struck me as I read the book was, I mean, 
you don't shy away from the hard things in Zora's life, right? I mean, part of it you read today in today's reading, right? That, you know, you know, her mother passed away when she was young and then she had the stepmother that she had conflict with and her father wasn't always present. And, you know, her and her siblings had a hard time and then she had to go away to school and she really wanted to like stay home. She loved Eatonville and she wanted to continue to learn and she couldn't, she had to work. And there's a way that you write about that that I think respects how much kids know and can understand and how resilient kids are without also, um, how could I say it? Like, it's not like just piling on trauma either, right? There's a sensitivity mm -hmm. to it. I just So one, I think maybe maybe that's part of the reticence around talking about Zora's story because uh -huh. if it's hard, maybe, I don't know. But I would be interested to hear more about both the writing and the sort of illustrating of these hard moments and how y'all approach that. Mm -hmm. um, for the hard moments, and you know, with a picture book, you're only allotted so many words. <laughs> and for, for to capture all of Zora in less than 1300 words, because I, I had the liberty to go up to 1300. They really wanted to be a lot less, but there was a way for us to even include the fun moments of folk tales in our little bubbles, which we I couldn't let those be uh, part of my word count either, right? So what what is essentially to weed out to get to the heart of who she was? And it was like this whole narr narrative of jump at the sun, right? Because everyone knows, if you don't know Zora's life, you might have heard Jump at the Sun. So many people have appropriated for organizations, for movies, or for but we've we've used it. Um, so we might understand that with everything that Zora has gone through, she still continued to jump at the sun. And me as a writer, I guess I didn't think about shooting too much because I feel like our children, we keep them in the bubble so much. And if you realize it, they are exposed. I mean, they're on TikTok. All right, the whole families have them on TikTok and Instagram, and they know how to use the phone. You know, so they have already been exposed to more than we give them credit for. And so our children come to school dealing with death. Our children come to school with divorce. We, so adding these elements, mentioning them, I, I guess it didn't bother me because perhaps my lifestyle has afforded me enough pain or um, to say, I know how relevant we need to add these, but the, the balance of storytelling and you can go through all of this and still come out shining. You just continue jumping at the sun was this whole repetitive thing for me. And it just wasn't, a, it wasn't a heavy thought about it. Yeah, and I uh, kind of think about just thinking back into my process, like uh, like this page that we read and saw um, is a, was a really hard time in her life, and it's also a a time when like she didn't write that much about it. Uh, as Alicia was saying, there's kind of bits of her history that are a little bit more foggy, and um, but I knew it was a really hard time for her, and I was actually making the illustrations a lot more dark at that like first like originally and because i knew uh, what a struggle that period of time was for her and i wanted to show that you know um so but the editor was like let's keep it positive let's show her you know um not necessarily these moments where uh of real struggle with, with the jobs she was doing it and what she was going through, but, you know, focusing on the things that she, uh, that kept bringing her back to what she loved. And so then, you know, it, and it became um, moments of the remembering what was driving her, which was storytelling. So in those really hard times of her life, what was the thing that kept bringing her uh, the courage to push forward? And so it was a good lesson for me to take as an illustrator too, because you know the words and the pictures shouldn't be telling the same thing. So if Alicia is talking about this really difficult time in her life, um, you know, with certain passages, you know, perhaps the illustrations should be uh, kind of balancing that out and representing her pushing through those moments. Um, 
And also, this you said Anansi earlier. No one else has has mentioned that. But when I realized that Brit Rabbit is the equivalent of Anansi, I uh, was like, "That's so cool!" And I have Anansi here. I snuck him in. And he's like a little tiny spider right here. And then they're reading Anansi, uh, Anansi folk tales. Because <laughs> like, I was like, I didn't know that was the same you know, culturally uh, from different places, but the same, like, trickster tale. Um, so I had to throw that in for you. cousins, a rabbit, and, you know, we don't think rabbits and spiders are connected, but, you know, they their parents are, are siblings or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. But they're, like, representing the same kind of uh, yeah, absolutely. character. I don't think it was, yeah. uh, I, you know, I love how you play, because your colors also represent a lot. You, even the darkness of the page with the house being um, when mom died. And you, you really played with the colors of it. Yes. But it wasn't heavy. And I tend to wonder with us writing this and, and illustrating, you have to realize and honor that there's artists, we artists, we live off our pain. You know, there's every artist has this whole, you know, I was living on two cents a day, right? We have this struggle but when you read Zora she mentions it but she doesn't uh wallow in it she'll she'll mention you know drinking from Sorrow's Kitchen you know eating from Sorrow's Kitchen but it wasn't in a way that you felt the darkness of her the heaviness of it so I think if it was someone else that I was researching and they had this whole dark period and it felt dark it might have translated different for me on the page but she didn't do that and it I, I think it would have dishonored her to represent that in any other way as well. No, well, that makes sense. It makes me think of her essay, How It Feels to Be Colored Me, right? Where she's like, I don't understand how people, you know, don't want to take pleasure in my company. Like, it's their loss. I'm too busy shopping my oyster knife. You know, that's very Zora to me that she's just like, well, it's your loss. Or even when there are terrible things happening, it's also, you know, like a, a place of beauty. So like this, this moment in the book, right? It makes me think of like, like a humid Florida night and like Spanish moss or something, you know, right. like sitting in there like, so there is pain, but there's beauty there too. So I think that definitely comes out in both the words and the illustrations. So maybe we could talk a bit about um, some of the, since we talked about folk tales, some of the favorite folk tales that y'all incorporated, whether in terms of the words, but also in terms of the, the pictures, the ones that y'all got to include, because I know there were, you know, constraints in terms of pages and, and word count and all of that, but what are some of the favorite ones that y'all got to include? I wish, I wish that would be a very easy question, <laughs> because, you know, when you read those, some of those tales in her books, they have some language <laughs> <laughs> that you can't really include, right? So I had <laughs> to know the excerpt that is child friendly. And I had, this was this was a shock. I didn't think that I would ha have the a email from uh, the, the publisher's lawyer called because they had to verify and I had to go through every single thing um, to verify which was actually Zora's words, stories, or which were from something she heard, and did anyone else own those rights? Because we had, and I thought, oh, well, this is, how in the heck will I know who said that? And, but, you know, some of her words, it said a name, but do they have that right? Because there was common, common stories. So I had to go through everything and drop anything that we had to question. So it wasn't as an easy thing like, oh, because one of my favorites had probably had to be edited out because I couldn't prove that who said it. And that was, it was so much into just even getting that, that it wore, it was a lot of work to even put that together. But there were, you know, the Edenville anthologies, I could really pull from those and like, we know Zora did it and we can credit her there. And those one liners where, um, even the one liners were um, a heart because, you know, um, here, because uh, we question, can we use the word fat? Is that, would that be body shaming? And I was like, but if I change it, that's what to use or, um, so it was just a lot of second guessing by the editors who want to make sure we won't ever be flagged for something. And there was something else 
uh, controversial. And I was like, ooh, it was something Coon Taylor. And the word Coon could have been like, so it was, it was not, it couldn't even be based on favorites. It was like, what can we use and what can we make sure that we won't um, offend, be offended, and you won't be offended? Because it's a different time period than when she told those stories. You're giving us a little backstage of the writing process, right? Where it's not simply just what you want to include, right? But right. the legal thing, the, the citation process and all that. So that's important. I had no idea when I went into this that that would be something that we'll have to deal with. I think I would have took better notes of everything, been more organized because it took a long time trying to like, where did I even see that? Where did what? You know, yeah. I would have been so organized. <laughs> yeah. I think a favorite, um, I mean, I loved all of the, all of the little snippets of the book, but um, two of my favorites are on this page, which was one of my favorite characters is this teeny tiny little snail right down here. <laughs> and the story behind her was that she was fed up with her husband and was trying to leave him, but she, snails are pretty slow. I am gonna butch, like not do this story justice, uh, but but um, basically she just you know packed up and and left one day. And I can't remember how it ended. I think it just ended. You know, like she just finally decided to to take off and pack up all of her bags and and leave him. Um, but I have her throughout the book because I thought she was uh, such a great little character, and I feel like also represents a lot of Zora's like characters in some of her novels, <laughs> you know, just like, I'm out of here, you know, this is not for me. Um, I love learning about the, yeah, I love learning about the squinch owls as well. I had, I didn't know what a squinch owl was, um, but they are, are supposedly also um, kind of foreshadowing death. Um, if you see an owl, I guess, like, you know, wherever it's kind of a sign that some sort of death is coming. Um, so I didn't know if Alicia did that on purpose because it was foreshadowing the mom's death in the book. Um, but I added the squinch owl back here onto that page that we were just looking at um, because it's a, you know, um, symbol of, of that. Another little detail I slipped in there. There's a lot of tiny little uh, connections that, you know, Zora, uh, her whole life was just one crazy, beautiful metaphor that she made for herself. And uh, there was, it's a, it was, it's an illustrator's like dream, I think. All of the visual uh, details that she has and the connections she made from her work to her life to the folktales and tying all those bits and pieces together was um, a really, really fun process. But it was kind of amazing to see how it, it all wrapped up into her own story. Um, you know, all of the stories that she found and that she created. Can I have to say one more thing? I, I do. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the Burr Rabbit. But maybe that's because those yeah. were the first tales I encountered, and those were the first that I memorized to tell. Um, and when I started telling, so I think that, and that drew me to like let's let's get deeper into where this comes from and who collected it and man, how come we aren't telling these as often? And please don't let this oral storytelling um, piece die. But when I go back to the pictures, I love to say when I tell um, Littles, and I think it's a, a important to mention the work, I can put words together on a page. And I just, when it was paired with the, uh, the right illustrator, it changes everything because we didn't get a chance to talk. They kept us totally separated. So her story was her story and mine was mine throughout. So the elements of this, my daughter looked at this, she was like, it's a scavenger hunt because to find these, the, even the snails and the, uh, the spiders on these pages, it's, it's so <laughs> I've looked at this book several times and I now discovered something new. But why I brought that up is because if you look closely on certain pages, Jackie might be able to pull it up. And I think this is my favorite part. Layered in the background, uh, Jackie, uh, oh. you want to tell that, Jackie, what you did? I think it's like having a piece of Zora in this book herself. 
Yeah, you know, in my uh, just internet research, I found a lot of her original, um, you know, typed out uh, plays. And because she did plays, she did, um, uh, and, and from some of her short stories. Um, so I found those and I, they have a lot of them in the Library of Congress. And so they have these, their, you know, resolution is really good. So I downloaded all of them and I was like, I have to incorporate them in. But some of my favorite bits were, um, like she drew out stage directions for a lot of the plays that she did. And so I, I loved seeing that and loved finding her handwritten little details on um, some of these things. And so I, I threw those into a lot of the pages. I think mostly just the pages with the quotes and the, like the little snippets um, to me kind of thinking like she's directing these pages, you know, and you get to see her, uh, her stamp on all of them. But that was a really fun discovery to, to, to be able to find those and use them. Um, I hope I was able to yes, legally did. use them. Yeah, that, <laughs> totally makes sense. that makes sense. And I love I just how you thought of that. I was like, ooh, <laughs> maybe I should <laughs> erase that. Erase that. <laughs> you, won't, you won't get in trouble. It's all it's it's all good. But it's like a scavenger hunt, right? Alicia, that's what you mentioned. That it's like, you know, so I can't wait to read this with, with young folk in my life and be like, okay, do you see this? Like, you know, I just just turning the page from what you were just showing, Jackie, with the Reverend Doorknob and Mr. Smell Sweet, and then the next page underneath where there's a little dog in the little cubby underneath the stairs, and the, the yeah. corn and the, and the soap and all of them are like, oh no, Zora's getting in trouble. I mean, like, I can't wait to yeah. meet the young person and be like, woo, and here's Bear Rabbit and Bear Fox over to the side. They're also looking, I mean, there's a lot here, so I think a lot of young readers and older readers will spend a lot of time looking at these different things. So we have questions from our audience. So let's get to some of them. Um, uh, this was answered a little bit, but maybe y'all can get more into talking about the specifics. But Carl Jung asks, how did the two of you work together? For example, Alicia, the hats metaphor as a compelling visual metaphor in the story. We didn't talk about the hats, so let's talk about it. And how did the two of you collaborate on this aspect of the book and on other aspects? Uh, we did not. Like I said before, they kept us totally separate. If there was a question that Jackie may ha have had, it would go to the editor. The editor would e email me. I have to email the editor back. Instead of her saying, hey, girl, do you remember? It, it just didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been so easy, so much easier. But I guess <laughs> for a reason. But and I did not do the hats. I mean, it's fascinating to hear what a visual artist sees in their head. And I would love. I can't do it justice. So Jackie, you want to talk about the hats? Yeah. Um, so this is like the end papers. Um, and I think as soon as you Google Zora, you'll realize that she loved wearing hats. Like she has hats in most of her photographs um, in her adulthood. But when I was reading her autobiography, um, I came across a quote that her dad said um, that was kind of putting her down when her dad told her, always trying to wear them big hats, uh, which basically was saying, you know, don't don't expect yourself to achieve that much in life. You know, you're not you're not gonna, you know, get that far. Because I, I think he was referring in those days, I think white people wore really big hats. And so they made they made that she made that connection in, in her autobiography, that it was kind of him basically saying, you know, some things are only for white people in this world to achieve. So don't set yourself up for failure. And um, I absolutely loved and thought that she just pounced on that idea. And she even took it so far as to wear some amazing, big, beautiful hats like the rest of her life. And so she just kind of took that thing that her dad told her and just tore it up into little pieces, uh, threw it away and, um, you know, kind of did that, I think, metaphorically with a lot of things in her life. And so from a visual perspective, I was like, this is one way to be able to tell that. So I wanted her mom, who was always a big supporter of her, obviously, um, to have this big, beautiful hat on in this page as kind of, uh, you know, visually her jumping, you know, was also 
just another visual thread to keep throughout the book was all of the hats that she was able to wear throughout the rest of her life. Um, yeah. That's where the hat That's another from. really interesting and, and <laughs> on Easter egg too. I mean, I wrote in the chat, uh, I think Courtney mentioned, I mean, Zora always just had the fashions. I mean, the cover of Wrapped in Rainbows, you know, the biography that B Valerie Boyd wrote of her. I mean, that is a gorgeous cover. She's like at a football game. She's just out. Yes, Zora. Oh, yeah. Fashions. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And it's like but I love that there was like a, a really, I, I don't know if I, I don't think that I'm, the only person to draw that connection, you know, between her love of hats and this quote, the, the, the thing that her dad told her that really resonated her, it, if she wrote it into her autobiography, it was something that she kept, you know, her whole life and, and kept thinking about. So um, I love that, the, yeah, the fashion element for sure, but that there, there, there's this really deep reason behind it as well. Love it. Love it. Love the yeah. fashion. <laughs> love the unapologetic yeah. darkness of it all. Um, okay, so Christina asks, Alicia, you write fiction and nonfiction. Do you have one genre you prefer, one that comes easier, and how does your work in one genre inform the other? Oh, goodness, that's such a great question. I don't have a preference yet because, you know, I'm just getting started, I feel, with this, with Genesis being my first and the picture book biographies being my second and third. I don't, I just love to tell stories, but I love history. I grew up, I wish I could say, Susanna, that I was like you, that I studied, they gave us Zora or Ms. Jane Pittman. I cannot remember a black story that I read growing up. Perhaps if I did have that representation, I would have already been delving into it. It wasn't until I went to college and um, I took my first African-American history class that I was like, oh my gosh, we did that? No, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold up. And so I, I made it my major. And so that influences my writing. So I think whether I write fiction or historical fiction or creative nonfiction, it is going to be history in it because I wasn't taught it and it's just my passion. And it just finds a way naturally in my writing. You, if you read Genesis, history is or all that people are like, did you purposely? It just threaded through naturally. I just like Zora. I love. I just love history. So neither one is my favorite, but I love it all. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good question. Well, I think it comes through in your writing. You know that you have that deep appreciation for history, and it's so it's so important, right? Um, Cassie writes, "Will you be willing to autograph a book for a book lover?" Oh, that's a personal. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't know how I do it, but we could do book plates. book plates. You could do book yeah. plates. We could do book plates. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. So people want to have, you know, they want to have that uh, copy on their shelf that is commemorated and has your John Hancock. So I you know, know and it's cold when it's over easy. with. I'm, I'll be signing, you know, in person. But for now, definitely, I can do book plates. Absolutely. And let's see, we have another question. Courtney asks, who is another person that um, both of y'all would like to make a picture book of? Mm, person. Because I told I told Jackie I would love to work with her again. She knows I'm a huge, huge fan of her. <laughs> I, 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 she's I, been sending me, sending me, um, what about this person? What about that person? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, write it, Alicia, come on. <laughs> you know, I, I did a um, story, and um, but there's not a lot of information on her. And so the, the research is not there, so it have to be inspired. But I did write a, a story, and I'll probably revisit it again, a Bessie Stringfield. Like, don't don't tell everybody to go write the story, because I already got a draft of it now. But Bessie Stringfield was the first. <laughs> hey, shh. Keep this here. Good, all right. Um, she was the first, and I think she kind of fabricated some things too, but she was the first uh, um, black woman um, to travel the world on her motorcycle, the USA, 19 times during Jim Crow in the 1930s. And um, she was, just to hear what she did during that time period was fascinating. It's, it's hard to verify, cross-reference, so I would love to write one inspired by her, uh, just to make it a fun read. But who I think 
whether I write it or not, who I think should have a picture book biography. And I don't know, understand why there isn't one, Lorraine Hansberry. I think Lorraine Hansberry should have one. I don't I think I have, have a good answer to that question. Looking for Lorraine, cool. so oh, I agree. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Go ahead, Jack. No, um, Alicia, you could sign me up for either of those, so that sounds good. <laughs> yeah, I, I, am, I am, I am, Jackie. Baby, this summer is I'm not working full time. I'm going, yes. <laughs> um, I don't think I have a good answer to that question, but I am just finalizing a thing for a, another biography, but I can't say who it is, but I just can say that I'm extremely excited for this project. So. Well, we will keep our <laughs> I, eyes peeled. I have another bio in the works, yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, well, you know, secret squirrel, but we'll keep our eyes peeled so that we'll be on the lookout for it. And that's what, that's the, actually the question I have, maybe our last question, unless folks pop another question in the question box is, things that you can talk about anyway projects that you're working on now, things that you're excited about? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, last summer, I think I started so many different projects, but then I was paralyzed for a second with uh, make a mistake of watching um, Amal Aubrey's video and I could not write two sentences together. Um, so it took me a minute to get back into the mind frame to write. And I wrote something during uh, NaNoWrite month. And I'm still trying to figure it out. I sent it to my editor, uh, my agent to say, hey, what do you think about the first 30 pages of this? And she was like, wow, the story needs to be told. So I'm trying to find out the story. But what I've gotten so far, she likes. So wish me luck that I can finish it because I have just, I realized that I had a lot of, beyond that, I had fear because this came as a debut with stickers. You know, it was awarded and like, will I live up to that, that fear of the second. So um, so keep keep me in your thoughts to just get it done, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get there, you'll get there. Um. I, you guys could probably see it on my wall a little bit behind me, but um, some, I'm finishing a, a follow-up book to my first book, The Field. Um, so I'll show one picture here. I was just working on this earlier. So um, it's a book about a hiking so we're back in St. Lucia in the Caribbean, and it's a, a really fun um, book just about a, you know, a hike through the tropical mountain. <laughs> um, and let's see what else. I have a bunch of other things on the horizon, but this comes out next year. And then I'm about to start my secret new biography and I'm doing a book called Jam 2, which is a really fun, very rhythmic book for uh, a younger audience. Um, I love to draw things with a lot of movement, dancing, and so that's going to be a really fun one because it, it'll, it'll be a lot going on, a lot of action. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And we yeah. got some good um, suggestions in the, in the chat. Folks want to see a Gwendolyn Brooks picture book. So oh, Gwendolyn Brooks. Are y'all adding to Jackie's list for real? Yep. All right, did he write that down? Write that down and just right, y'all right. start to collaborate on that. Y'all gonna try? Y'all gonna yeah, We're giving you work. We're giving you work to do. <laughs> so you know, we'll give you till about 2024, 20, 20, You know, that's fine. Gwendolyn Brooks. Okay, I got it. I got Gwendolyn Brooks. Somebody uh -huh. said that uh -huh. Jackie, if we do Bessie Springfield. That means we got to do a road trip, uh -huh. like Bessie on a motorcycle. <laughs> oh, and Nikki okay. Giovanni, yeah. Nikki Giovanni just, um, Courtney just mentioned Nikki Giovanni too. So, boop. Men yep, there you go. So, Courtney, I think you just added more and more and more. Did you? <sighs> okay, okay. Nothing right. wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. I think oh, there's a, a whole isn't there a beautiful Gwendolyn Brooks bio out recently? Is, isn't it? Is it? It might be. 
Well, Gwendolyn yeah. deserves many, many more. So oh, be absolutely. absolutely. Like, our many. hero women, oh. and they do deserve more than one book. I mean, we got a lot on like particular people and to give us a narrative that's not one of just fighting for civil rights or um, enduring slavery or something, that that black joy, I think we definitely need that balance of stories in, for our children. Because representation is so, so very important, as well as knowing um, that our stories is this. And I say this as an educator when I've seen kids do uh, their biography projects and, you know, who they have is either, you know, I can name on one hand. They have uh, Martin Luther King, Oprah Winfrey, Michelle Obama. Um, who else are doing? Michael Jordan and like. We don't have a lot that they're doing compared to uh, the counterparts. So I just really feel like we, we, our stories can be as diverse as, as like Azura and, and Gwendolyn Brooks, that we could have so many more. I'm writing it down. Okay, Courtney. <laughs> I'm going to give, I'm going to give my own uh, example too. I would love to see a Mae Jemison. She went right into space. Just saying. Somebody should just give us a five book deal of biographies to Jackie. <laughs> there you go. Any any other questions? I think that we covered all of them. Are, are there any other things that y'all want to leave us with besides this gorgeous book and all of its amazing stories within it? All the little Easter eggs. I mean, I just can't wait to read this again with a little one in my life. Thank y'all so much for putting this book together, for creating all this amazing art and storytelling. It's amazing and definitely does Zora justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It was great talking with you. Jump at the Sun, the true life tale of unstoppable story catcher Zora Neale Hurston. Awesome. Yes. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Susanna. Um, if y'all don't own this book yet, you can click the teal button at the bottom center of your screen to buy it directly from Karis. Um, as an independent feminist bookstore, it really helps us when you buy event books directly from us. Um, we would love for you to buy one for a young person in your life, but also potentially for yourself because children's books make great coffee table books and inspire your own creativity. Um, so we think children's books really are just human books that all people should have. Um, the We want to encourage you also, if you uh, are not regularly checking the Keras calendar, please do. We are doing a ton of events in the, we, in the last few days of March, and we have a packed April calendar. So please visit us online at www.karisbooksandmore.com um, for that full schedule. The last thing it is my uh, honor and pleasure to do is to remind folks that we are a nonprofit and all of our events are individually donor sponsored. So um, they are always free, but we do appreciate any donation that folks are able to do. Thank you to the Auburn Avenue Research Library. Um, Y'all's resources continue to enrich our learning and it's such a gift to be in this partnership with all of you. Um, and finally, thank you to our guests today. Uh, I learned so much and um, it's just, it is a joy to get to see our literary heroes reflected in new ways. Um, so thank you for making Zora more accessible to more people. Um, we think this book is gonna continue to be such a resource um, for so many people. So thank you so much and um, stay well and stay safe.